God bless you for being here. Um, we're actually continuing a series from a year ago. I, I put a series on a calendar last year called Men of the Bible and thought, okay, well, I'll give that four weeks. Four. Four. So it, it became very apparent that we were going to, at some point, pick this up. And so what will happen is you and I are going to learn from some distinct characters in the Bible. Um, sometimes we're going to learn by the way they do things correctly, and sometimes we're going to learn by the way they do things stupidly, <laughs> incorrectly. Maybe that's a better word. And, and then we're going to kind of climax this whole thing on Father's Day. So here's what I need you to go ahead and start doing. Go ahead and call dad, call brother, call any man that you know that would benefit from a message that would cause him to step into his God-given leadership role as a man of God. You call them and get them here on Father's Day. Will you do that? Two of you is going to do that. Are you starting to get the trend here when I say you're going to do that? I won't have to repeat myself if you'll go, yes, we will do that. See, there we go. See, thank you. Give me a what, what, Clint Banks. Give me a what, what. I, yeah, thank you. Thank you. There we go. I'm just in a silly mood today. And part of that, I, I'll just, <laughs> I told them in the, I told them in the, in the prayer room, y'all are going to laugh at this. And I, I may have told you this before, but a lot of times on Sunday mornings, before anybody gets here, I'll come out and I'll preach my sermon to an empty room. I know you think that's weird, but you do this 48 times a year and you'll see that it, it, it's a little hairy sometimes. And usually here's what happens. I walk out and I'll think, man, I hope I preach as good when everybody's here as it was when I was here by myself. Well, today was exactly the opposite. I was like, that was terrible. Mikey said, you didn't get one amen, did you? And I said, yeah, I don't think I deserved one either. It was just not good. Amen. Amen. So I got. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have about 35 minutes of expectation of what God's going to do in our life. Um, I, I would be concerned if, the, if God's ability to change your season was according to my eloquence. My eloquence has nothing to do with what God wants to do in your life today. So I, here's what I need you to understand. Um, we're going to grow over the next few weeks. The, let me see. Oh, last few weeks, we've been talking a lot about connecting. We, we talked about face-to-face -face worship a few weeks ago. You remember that? We were talking about coming in and, and, and connecting with God in our worship. Donna last week uh, talked about how we need to make a choice. To be a follower and not a fan. And now we're going to step into the growth part. I'm expecting, and I want you to come into this house every week expecting to grow. Expecting for God to change you. Expecting for God to do a work in your life. And if you're in this room today and you think, I don't need to grow. I'm good right where I'm at. You need to grow more than anybody else. So we're going to talk about Moses today. Moses, the story of Moses. And I had to kind of, if you understand, if you've read the, the story of the Exodus, it's, a lo, it's, it's almost 40 chapters. There's no way we could talk about that in, in a few minutes. So we're going to talk about two particular events that happened. I want to read a passive scripture to you, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a review on Moses' life. Exodus 33, verse 11, it's in, your, it's in your bulletin. It says, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. If you're unfamiliar with the story of Moses, the children of Israel, the Hebrew nation, was in captivity to the Egyptian nation. And the Egyptian leaders were concerned that, their, that the Hebrew population was growing to such a degree that they could, it could be a military issue at some point. And so they ordered all of the male children to be put to death. 
Moses is born. His parents want to protect him, so they put him in a basket in the Nile River and send him downstream. You should turn off your devices. And so Pharaoh's daughter, if you know the story, finds Moses, raises him as her own, and Moses grows up in Pharaoh's house as the prince of Egypt. Not forsaking his own identity, he sees uh, a Hebrew brother being abused by uh, an Egyptian, murders the Egyptian, runs away on the backside of a desert for 40 years, high, just distancing, distancing himself from Pharaoh's house and becomes a shepherd for 40 years. God calls him to lead the people of Israel out of bondage into a place where they could worship, into the promised land. And that's kind of the story in a nutshell. But here's, there's two events I want us to just hang on to. There's a, there's a point. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the burning bush. We're going to talk about the Red Sea. Now, when I say Moses, some of you and maybe my generation see this guy. You, you remember this guy. It, it was a... It was a great movie, by the way. It was uh, leading edge special effects for the day. But some of you maybe that are in a generation behind me, when I say Moses, you see this guy. <laughs> the story of Moses is one of the most powerfully illustrative deliverance stories that you could. It's an epic. That's why they make movies about it. So I want us to look at what Moses taught us at the burning bush and what Moses taught us about the Red, at the Red Sea about these things, about excuses, about obstacles, and about God's purpose. About excuses, about obstacles, and about God's purpose. Just so I know that you're in the right room, if you're here and you would say, Dwayne, there has been a time when God's asked me to do something and I made an excuse why I couldn't, raise your hand. Okay, if, if you're in this room and God's ever asked you to stop doing something that you're already doing and you made excuses why you couldn't, raise your hand. We are in the right place. So Moses taught us some things, a lot of things, but we're just going to talk about those two at the burning bush and at the Red Sea. The burning bush and at the Red Sea. The first thing is God, Moses taught us that God's plan for you may be bigger than you. Now, if you watch the Charlton Heston version of the Exodus, you're going to see him leading about 300 people across the Red Sea. Now, what scholars tell us is there could be as many as 2 million people. 2 million people, all the livestock, all of the, their stuff, their, you know, enough U-Hauls for 2 million people. And God says, Moses, I need you to take these people away and, and, and lead them. Would you be a little intimidated at a task that size? I'm going to tell you that God may put something in your path that is bigger than you. God may give you something to do that is bigger than you. God may ask you to stop doing something that you think is bigger than you. So what do we do in those moments? Uh, see, I can't speak to you from your perspective. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to you from mine. Because here's how, how my life has worked. I remember not long after Don and I got married, Pastor Jim Talley at the Dorable Church of God said, Dwayne, I want you to lead worship on Wednesday nights. I can't do that, Pastor. Yes, you can. But I, I, I can't do that. I, I've never done that. I don't know... You can do it. I just began to make excuses as to why I couldn't. And, and you know what? For about six months on Wednesday nights, I, I led worship. And then we fast forward a few years, and Donna and I are serving as youth and Christian education directors at a church not too far from here. And our worship pastor leaves. And our senior pastor comes to me and says, Dwayne, for a, a little while, turned out to be five and a half years, but for a little while, I need you to take care of the choir and, and, and direct our music. And I said, I can't do that. And he said, yes, you can. 
And so for five and a half years, we, we did that. And then we wind up at, an, at a job interview in Statesboro, Georgia, and I realize I'm following a nearly church fatal moral failure, and i am been called in here to pick up the pieces, and I said, I can't, I can't do that. This time it was God. He said, yes, you can. Fast forward a few years later, and I'm circling that campus with almost a fist in heaven saying, God, I can't plant a church in Loganville. Yes, you can. I need you to hear something. If God doesn't call you to do something that's bigger than you, you don't need him. See, some, some of you have, by the help and grace of God, have conquered addiction. Not on your own, but because God's help and grace and mercy has flooded you. But can I tell you, on your own, it's bigger than you. So I'm just going to start this sermon by saying, expect God to stretch you. Expect God to do something that you, it blew Moses' mind. And you're going to see in just a minute how he began to give God every reason, and some of them legitimate. So why he can't do what God asked him to do. But God had a plan. If, if God had a plan for Moses, does he have a plan for you? God had a plan for Moses. Does he have a plan for Joy Shaw and the Lundies and Daniel Robertson? Does God have a plan for you? He absolutely does. His plan, God's plan was to bring his people out of captivity. Their purpose was to worship. Now listen, here's how, here's how God laid this out in front of Moses. Verse 12 of chapter 3 says, And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Do you find it interesting that he didn't say, when you brought the people out of Egypt, they'll set up agricultural systems. And they'll have families and communities. And they'll, they'll form a brand new nation. So he said, he said, I'm going to bring you out and you're going to worship. And I need you to hear me. Whatever God asks you to do, whatever God asks you to stop doing, it's not so you can have a better life. It's not so you can have a better reputation. It's to put you and others in a place of worship. Period. So, this is where it gets interesting to me. Because God is now telling Moses what he wants him to do. In, in verse 10, he says it this way. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now let's look at those first three words. So now go. So now go. Maybe we could say it, so go now. So now go. So now go. How many know that delayed obedience is disobedience? Now... We don't have time to go through the whole discourse, but can we, let's take a few minutes. He said, so now go. And then Moses said to God, this is verse 11. I don't know if I gave it to you or not, but it's verse 11. Just trust me. M Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses said, who am I? God said, go. Moses said, who am I? Have you ever said that to God? God said, son, I want you to plant a church. Who, who am I? God said, I want you to teach a class. I want you to start a ministry. I want you to help give people clothes and help provide dog food for them. I want you to do this. Who am I? I'm going to pick up my wife. We, we brought this keyboard home after we planned the church. And she said, who's going to play that? I said, you are. <laughs> she said, who am I? I know seven chords. Have you ever felt that way? God said, man, I've got something big for you to do. I've got something big for you to stop doing. Who am I? Hear me. God knows exactly who you are. If, 
If God didn't have confidence that Moses could do exactly what God had called him to do, why would he have bothered having the conversation with him? Moses was known by God, and God knew exactly all about Moses' inconsistencies and all his failures and all of his problems and all of his insecurities, and God said, go now. (laughs) Moses said, but who am I? And God answers it just like this. I know who you are, and it doesn't matter. And if were I Moses, I would go, yeah, it kind of does. It, it kind of does. He said, who am I? God said, I know who you are, and it doesn't matter because verse 12 says, and God said, I will be with you. And it's almost as if you hear the Father God saying, Moses, you don't understand. I'm, I'm not sending you in there by yourself. I'm not sending you down this path all alone. I'm not, sending, I'm not telling you to do something that, that you, you could even do by yourself. But you need to calm down. I'm with you. When he's, when he's trying to draw something out of your life that doesn't belong, it's so easy to go, Do you know who I am? Yes, but it doesn't matter. Because I'm going to be with you. If God is for us, who can be against us? It doesn't matter. We can try to talk our way out of what God's asked us to do with all sorts of excuses. All sorts of reasons. All sorts. And you know how there's a difference between an excuse and a reason, isn't there? Would you agree with that? Okay, well, a reason would be, okay, you brought up a size 40 men's suit coat onto this stage and said, Dwayne, put it on. There's a reason I couldn't do that. I haven't been size 40 since shortly after the second grade. Now, I could try. If I got it on, it wouldn't come off. But what if? Now, there's, that's a reason. You with me? Here's where the excuses come in. What if you brought a size 44 and said, Dwayne, in three months, I want you to put that on? Um, I, I just don't think I can do that. Why? Well, the real reason is I like chicken wings and pizza too much. And that's when the excuses start, right? And that's exactly what happened to Moses. He, he, he said, who am I? And God said, I'll go with you. And then, God, and then Moses said, suppose I go. Now, parents, wave at me. One translation says, if I go. What? Really? That's Moses' response after God said, I'm going with you. You're, I, I'm there. And Moses says, uh, if I go. You ever got that from your kids? I want, you, I want you to clean your room. Well, suppose I do. Now, I'm not saying he did because I, I, I don't know. But were I God, my attitude changes right then. You with me? Suppose I go. What if I go? I don't have the ability. I don't have the tools. I don't have all the stuff I need. And here's what God said. He didn't say, you know, I'm going to teach you. I'm going I'm to equip you. He said these words, what's in your hand? Moses is making all these excuses. And it's like God said, stop. What's in your hand? Moses looks at his hand. You know what's there? Stick. It's a staff, but really what it is, it's a big, heavy stick. Moses, what's in your hand? A stick. Just so you know who I am, throw it on the ground. And Moses throws the stick on the ground, and it becomes a snake. And I'm thinking, it even says in, in, in Scripture, Moses is freaking out right now. He's like, what is going on? It's a And he's like, and there's nobody here to see it. (laughs) 
My greatest golf shots have come when there's nobody else around. It's a, and then God says, grab its tail. It, it turns into a stick again, and Moses is blown away. But he's still not convinced. Would that be enough for you? Would, okay, before you get on Moses' case... How many times have we said, God, I can't do that? And he said, you know what? You've got everything you need. Well, I, I can't plant a church. I don't have any money. I, 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 can't, I can't stop this addiction. I don't have the willpower. You've got everything you need. What's in your hand? See, you, what, what Moses didn't realize is all of that time on the backside of a desert, wasn't there. he wasn't there in vain. Moses wasn't there tending sheep. Moses was there learning how to lead. What's in your hand, Moses? So I'm going to ask you, for that thing that God's asking you to do, what's in your hand? What special skill, what incredible talent has God put in your life that you've been, you, you feel like you've been cultivating in obscurity? Nobody knows it's there. Listen to me. God's got a plan. And God's all that you need to be obedient to God is what you already possess. What's in your hand? And we still make excuses. Listen to me. Let me tell you what an excuse is. An excuse is a lie with a teaspoon of truth. See, if you keep reading down, Moses would say, I can't go because I don't speak well. I have a, I, I, my tongue gets tangled up. I, I can't go because I don't speak well. And see, that's a lie with a teaspoon of truth. The truth is, he doesn't speak well, but that doesn't mean he can't go. See, it would be easy for me to say, I can't fit into that coat because it's harder to lose weight when you're, when you're 50. Is it harder to lose weight when you're 50? Yes, but that doesn't mean you can't fit into the coat. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? How we make excuses. We, we, we dash a little bit of truth in our reasons, in our, in our words about why we can't be obedient to what God is calling us to do or not to do. And we'll dash a little bit of truth in there to make us feel better. Now, I want you to hear something. This is not a sermon to beat you up about your excuses. I want us to take just a minute and look at why we make them in the first place. Why did Moses start making excuses? Exactly. You would too. He's terrified at the thought. First of all, he grew up in Pharaoh's house and he knew what kind of man he was. And he knew that people just didn't walk into his court and go, hey, do this. And it end well for them. Beyond that, suppose he said, yes, now I've got to lead two million people out across the desert. I don't know how to feed them. I don't know how to take care of them. I don't know any of this stuff. Of course he's scared. And can I tell you that fear is the basis for your excuses of why you won't be obedient to God. It's not a giving sermon, but that's what I, that's what I hear when people tell me why we can't be generous. Well, I'm afraid that if we do this, we won't be able to do that. You with me? Could it be, could it be that an excuse is the devil's roadblock to get, that, that's blocking you from getting to where God wants you to be? Could it be that if Moses just dug his feet in the ground at the burning bush, what happens? Are the children of Israel still in Egypt? No. You know what God does? He finds somebody else. And Moses never fulfills what God had destined him to do. And so I'm going to tell you that you dig your heels in the ground in disobedience. You're not hurting God. You're, you're allowing the devil to put a roadblock in your path toward God's perfect plan for your life. So your life, it'll go much better for you if you just say yes. Oh, I don't want to. I don't, want, I don't want my fear 
of what it looks like if I say yes to God to stop me from saying yes to God. Does that make sense? I don't want my fear of what might happen to prevent me from following God's plan and becoming the man he's called me to be. And listen to me, I don't want that for you. I don't want your fear of what it might look like if you say yes to stop you from fulfilling and finding God's plan. And listen, I have to speak a little ambiguously here because uh, we've all got a different plan. God's probably not going to call you to plan a church. He might. So you've got to find those areas in your life where you found excuses to why you can't. It, it looks a lot like this. I really, I really can't uh, serve because, you know, Sunday's my only day. Okay, Sunday might be your only day, but that doesn't mean you can't serve. And I'm not beating you up about an excuse. Yeah, you know, I guess I kind of am, aren't I? I? But it's not because I'm. I want you to understand my motives are pure this morning. I believe that God has a purpose and plan for you. And I don't want you to let saying no stop the process. So all this discourse at the burning bush and Moses finally, I don't speak so well. God says, listen, take your brother and they, they go to, to Pharaoh and we don't have time for the whole story, but after 10 plagues, Pharaoh finally says, okay, get out of here. I'm sick of looking at you. I'm sick of looking at your people. And they take off. Two million of them. All the donkeys. All the... What's funny is if you watch the movie, I, I just watched a little clip of it. Um, for some reason, they had a bunch of ducks. <laughs> I found that hilarious. That they, you know, Here's all these Hebrew people and a bunch of ducks. I just thought that was interesting. All the livestock and... The, and they get out across the wilderness. And, and if you read the, the Bible care, carefully, there was a shorter route. But God intentionally took them to the Red Sea. M maybe you need to hear this. Every obstacle you face doesn't come from hell. I believe God allows obstacles to come into our life. To grow us and shape us and learn for us to learn to depend on who God is and what he wants to do in our lives. So they get to the bank of the Red Sea, realize that Pharaoh's army is coming behind them. And it's Red Sea in front of them, Pharaoh's army behind them. And guess what they start doing? What, what we do best. We start complaining. We respond in fear. Moses... Now it's his fault, right? This is your fault. Weren't there enough graves in Egypt for us? You brought us out here to die. Pharaoh, we're going we're gonna to get crushed under Pharaoh's army. And you saw the, you, you've, you've all seen the movies. The, the pillar of fire blocks Pharaoh's armies while the Red Sea parts and they go through on dry ground. I heard a story one time of of the scientist that was challenging a Christian, challenging this older lady that had been following Christ for many, 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 many years. And the scientist said, well, listen, I hate to bust your bubble, but uh, they've proven that where the Hebrew army, the Hebrew people crossed the Red Sea, it was only about a foot and a half of water. So it really wasn't, really wasn't that big a deal. And the, and the lady said, oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, she, and he's like, I don't understand what, what you're so excited about. I just told you that it wasn't a miracle. They crossed in a foot and a half of water. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. What are you so excited about? God drowned all them Egyptians in a foot and a half of water. <laughs> so you've seen it. You've seen it. It's, you've seen the movie. They cross over. And here's what's cool. is The Bible says they cross on dry ground. So the breath of God is not only powerful enough to part the waters, but to suck all the moisture out of it. 
Would you call that a miracle? Here's, here's what you need to write down. Every miracle begins as an obstacle. How many of you have, have seen a miracle? How many of you are living with a miracle? It began as an obstacle. Here's what we got to learn how to do. This is how we got to spiritually, we got to grow spiritually. Because I need you to understand that on the other side of the Red Sea, you're going to run out of water. In other words, just because you get through this obstacle doesn't mean there's not going to be another obstacle behind it. Right? I, I, I knew that wasn't going to get a lot of amens because we like, to think, we like to think about the miracle across the Red Sea. We don't like to think about their problems on the other side of it. So what I, how I want us to grow is this. Let's change how we look at those obstacles. Because the, the people of Israel stood at the banks of the Red Sea and complained. How can we possibly get across that huge sea? The, the army behind us is going to kill us. They spent so much time looking at the obstacle, they didn't bother to look at their God. And here's what Moses says. I love the way he says it. He, I have this picture that just like Charlton Heston, he gets up on this rock. And he puts that staff in the air and he says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I look at it like this. I, I think he said it like this. Shut up. <laughs> you bunch of whining crybabies. Here's what you're about to see. You're so focused on the obstacle. You're so focused on the problem. You're so focused on... On, on the issue. You're so focused on the addiction. You're so focused on your finances. You're so focused on your children. You're so focused on all this other stuff. All the obstacles. You're so focused on that. You haven't bothered to look at the size and the majesty of your great big God. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to shut up, stand still, and watch. And that's exactly what happened. And Moses stood. And, and the Bible says that the waters parted on dry ground. Do you think that they paid attention then? For a little while yeah. till they got to the next obstacle so let's do this let's be different than the children of Israel when your next obstacle comes and oh it's coming you may be in a great place right now but Jesus said in this world you will have trouble but I've overcome the world so chill out so here's what I want us to do when the next obstacle comes let's not focus on that Let's not focus on the size of the obstacle. No matter how great, big it might be, let's not focus on that. Let's not focus on the relationship. And let's not focus on, on, on all of the things that, we, that human nature compels us to focus on. And focus on the greatness and the majesty and the all-powerful God that we serve. Shouldn't that change our perspective? When we come to those obstacles, listen, just quit looking at the obstacle. Listen, some, I know some of your stories, and you've jumped over so many hurdles, you're like a track star. And if you focus on, on, on the next hurdle, so our focus is going to be on our great big God. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you five things in about five minutes. And I hope we're going to do this each week. We'll call it from one life to another. We're, what, can we, what can we transpose from Moses' life and Moses' story that we've talked about to our life? I'm going to give you five things, okay? Here we go. First thing, just as a reminder, you may think you're tending sheep, but you might be learning how to lead. You may think you're tending sheep. In other words, you may think that what you're doing that where you're at isn't benefiting you or anybody else, but you don't know what God might be doing in your life behind the scenes. You don't know what, how he's growing you in ways that you don't even recognize that you're growing. In other words, let's say it like this. Don't despise the season in your life when you don't know what God's doing. Because just because you don't know what God's doing doesn't mean he doesn't know what he's doing. That's the first thing. The second thing, stop with the excuses. 
Okay? Can we just covenant together that we're going to be a church? We're just not going to make excuses like that. Well, God, I can't because. I'm not going to because. I can't because. I can't because. I can't. Yes, you can. I don't like excuses. I don't. Especially when it comes to our church. I don't like excuses. I don't like, well, we're a smaller church, so we can't do this. I don't like that. You know what that is? That's a lie with a little bit of truth. I'm going to tell you what I think. Y'all love me, so don't judge me. But I see Life Point Community Church being a city on a hill in this community. I see us leading the way. I don't, maybe that doesn't mean that we've got the most people, but can I tell you something? I, I believe that, that God's using us to, to light this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will not make excuses that we don't have a big enough building, we don't have a big enough staff, we don't have enough money. We will not do that. You know what we're doing when we do that? We're looking at the obstacle instead of the great big God that we serve. We will not do that. Stop with excuses. Number three, practice instant obedience. Maybe we should change our little phrase. We always say, listen to God, do what he says. Right? We always say that. Maybe we should add a word. Listen to God, do what he says. Now. Now. Listen to God, do what he says. Now. Can I give you a challenge? Oh, see. I, <laughs> I, sometimes you get up here. And like I'm, I'm a person that I don't like to make people mad. But sometimes you get up here and you, you feel the, the spirit of the Lord on you and just quit caring. <laughs> it, you know, you guys are taking notes and watching the screen. And you're getting involved in all this. Get it. If you, if you really want to put your money where your mouth is, do this. Lord, we're going to take an offering in a little while. What would you have me give? Okay, here's what you, some of you already said. Well, I, I gave online before we came. That's not what I asked you to do. And listen, listen, I'm not, I'm not here pulling money out of you. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just saying, if you really want to see how this works, he may say nothing. You're good. And, and, well, I didn't bring my checkbook. Well, scan that little QR code in your bulletin. I didn't, my, you didn't bring your checkbook, but that's not a reason. Man, it got quiet in here when I started talking about money. <laughs> and, and listen, I, I need you to know, I'm not talking about money. I'm, I'm giving you an example of how the enemy will work to stop you from being obedient to God. It's so easy for those excuses to start, aren't they? Well, I didn't bring my checkbook. I don't have any cash. Text 84321. You know what we've done? We've removed, removed all those excuses for you. So if you really want to see how this works, do this today. God, what would you have me give? I'm not asking you for a nickel. I'm not, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Just ask God. What you do with that now is up to you. I don't care. I, that, that was, oh, that, see, I told you. I say things that are mean, and I didn't mean that. I do care. I love you, and I want to see you blessed. And, and I, that was literally an analogy because as soon as I said that, some of you started going, well, I didn't, I can't, I can't. And all I asked you to do, I didn't ask you to give a nickel, did I? What did I ask you to do? Ask God. Isn't that funny how the enemy works? He starts planting those excuses. All right. Practice instant obedience. Number four, view obstacles as an opportunity for God's power to be displayed. If you'll read that story that, we, that we've been dancing around, God said at one point, I'm even going to find glory in Pharaoh's hard heart. Can I pick on, I'm going to pick on joy for a minute. Because I, I, I watch, I, I'm a people watcher. Any other people watchers in the room? Okay. I, joy had this tank that she was driving <laughs> she called it the ministry machine but, but can I, listen she drove from Marietta with this thing packed full of garbage bags and it was really it, 
you know, I, I wouldn't say this when she was still driving it, but I, I think it was duct tape and zip ties that was keeping this thing on the road. <laughs> and it had been real easy to look at that as an obstacle. But she didn't. You know what she did? She, she filled it full and said yes to God. God, if, if you want me to get this stuff to the other side of metropolitan Atlanta, I'll put him in my truck and I'll get it over there. And there's been times we had to help her get home. You know, so we learned to keep zip ties and duct tape in the church here. Well, God just miraculously got our new vehicle. So we don't look at the obstacle. God knows what you need. God knows where you're at. Let's, let's be more concerned with our obedience and stopping with the excuses and let God worry about the provision. That was a better line than y'all responded. Let's let God worry about the provision. Let's just be, let's do what we can do. Any providers in the room? No. Any creators here? No. But you can be obedient to the creator and the provider of all things. All right. And lastly, never forget your purpose. And I need to take two minutes and, just, and, and explain what I mean by that. Because your purpose is the exact same purpose as Moses' purpose. R R okay, Dwayne, now you lost me. So what you're saying is, what my purpose is, is to lead the Israeli people to the promised land. No, that wasn't Moses' purpose. That was Moses' task. There's a distinct difference between your purpose and your task. Your task can change. Your purpose never will. Yeah, that's right. So here's what Moses' purpose was. Number one was to get free. God said, lead the people out of Egypt, right? He never said, push them out of Egypt. So in order for him to lead the, into freedom, where did he have to go? He had to go to freedom himself. He said, get free and then lead others to freedom. Your job, your purpose is to get free. See, if, if you're here in this building and you're still bound with the chains of sin, you can get free today, right now, today. Well, I might later. No, today, right now, you can get free. If you're bound with a chain of sin, you can get free today. So does that mean my life's going to be perfect from this point forward? Nope. You're going to face an obstacle probably before you get out of the parking lot. But you can get free today. So purpose number one, freedom. Find freedom. Get free. Purpose number two is get somebody else free. You know what we got in, our, in, in the North American church? A lot of people that will say, well, guess, bless God, I'm free. I'm just waiting on the trumpet to sound. You might want to be careful with that. Man, if you're still on this planet, I don't care if you're 103, your job is to get free and help somebody else get free. So that, that's what he told Moses to do, right? He said, lead them out of Egypt. So he's getting free. He's getting somebody else free. And he said, I want you to bring them back here. Why? What was their job? What were they going to do? Bring them back here to worship. So I want you to get free. I want you to help somebody else get free. Listen. And I want you to bring God glory. The quicker we realize that this life is not about us, but the reason we're still sucking air, it's your breath in our lungs is to bring glory to God. Not make ourselves famous, not, not put ourselves at the limelight. Hey, He must increase. We must decrease. So we're going to get free. We're going to help somebody else get free. We're, our lives are going to bring God glory. And what, was it, what did he tell the, uh, that he was going to bring the children of Israel back to the mountain to do? And to make space for worship. We're going to get free. We're going to help somebody else get free. We're going to, our lives are going to bring God's glory. And every day of my life, I'm creating space to worship you, Lord. That's your purpose. Period. Donna, come and play. Thank you, Jesus, for freedom.
Father, forgive Dwayne for all the excuses. Oh, but they're stopped today. <laughs> I stopped talking on purpose. In the quietness of this moment, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to talk to God. God, what if, where, are you trying, where are you trying to take me that my excuses have prevented me from going there? God, what, are, what is it that you want out of my life? And I found every excuse in the world why, why I can't do that. What obstacle am I facing that's preventing me from my purpose? Don's going to play softly. I just want you to search your heart. I just want you to talk to God for a minute. God, what is it? What are you trying to do in my heart today? God's doing something in my heart today. Just put your hand in the eye. Yeah, 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 yeah. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for men and women, young and old, who are sensitive to what the Spirit of God wants to do in their life. So we say yes. say go now and you say and we say yes you say do and we say yes you say serve we say yes you say give and we say yes you say stop we say yes we want to respond in obedience to you oh God we want to remove the excuses we want to more than the excuses, God, we cast out fear. Your word says perfect love casts out fear. So today, God, would your perfect love surround and smother and encapsulate your people. There'll be no reason for excuse because we trust you and know you're leading us down the right path. God, some of us are facing obstacles. God, just like Elijah prayed for his servants, spiritual eyes to be open. God, I pray that you open our spiritual eyes to take them off of the obstacle and put them on the mighty acts of our great God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Get free. Help somebody else get free. Live your life in such a way that you bring glory to God. And every day of your life, create space for worship. You ought to give God praise in Jesus' name. Yes.